So we're still fighting to keep it in the ground at the source. So we're teaching people that not only to keep it in the ground, but what are we going to do if we don't have this industry? Because I have brothers and uncles and cousins that work in the industry. That's their job. Workers are really feeling um, uh, vulnerable in, in the economy for a variety of different reasons, but especially if you're in a heavy emitter industry is what am I going to do? What am I going to do and what are my children going to do? What kind of future are we going to have for them? When we talk about new jobs, we need to talk about them being decent jobs. We need to talk about them not being precarious. But what's really clear and not said enough is that they need to be organized, right? Because that's where power is. Power is in organized labor. We to know a place very beautiful in Dortmund, which is called Lago Phoenix, which una antigua fábrica de metales que había cerrado y ahora están con viviendas de clase alta. Parece que están todos los jugadores del equipo de Borussia Dortmund están ahí. Y empresas, startups, un montón de lugares. Había una persona explicando y yo pregunté, pero la fábrica que está acá, ¿qué pasó? Bueno, se desmontaron todo y se llevaron a la China y ahí se montaron otra vez y está ahí produciendo metal. Me parece un, un buen ejemplo de que no es transición justa. Fue extenso toda la discusión sobre la salida del, del carbón. Desde el punto de vista de los sindicatos de acá, que ya sé que, que es complicado, que bueno, para, para se discutir, se habla mucho que los trabajadores del carbón, que producen eh, bastante contaminación, pero tienen buenas condiciones de trabajo. Todavía en cuanto a los eh, trabajadores y trabajadoras que están en las eh, energías renovables, no tienen seguridad y tienen pésimos eh, trabajos. Estas son las contradicciones que estamos viviendo todos los días. The Hamburg Forest, they try to steal it, cut down the trees and dig another coal pit. But we must save the carbon sink, protect those mighty trees. The forest for the beast, but and the bees. This land is yours. It's crazy to think about just transition in this modern context because it's almost like we're going back <laughs> to how we already were living for thousands of years before colonization. We were farming tribes and we had a really vast trading system in the Americas until smallpox, until colonization. If you breathed in the air, you died. And so there was these whole villages, maybe 20,000 people, gone. We were put on the reservation. We did not get forced into a cash economy until the 1940s, when a dam was built on the Missouri River, a series of dams. The United States government flooded all of our class one and class two agricultural lands and forced us to go onto the top, the highlands where the winds blow, so it's dry, it's crusty, it's hard to grow up there. They told us that we had to become ranchers that we had to learn how to take care of cattle. Why is it that we're forced into a job becoming our livelihood? That's what colonization has taken away from us, is literally our livelihoods, and makes us think that that job, that nine to five, 
is what is our reality. It's a false reality that's been put onto us by a capitalistic model. And so for me, just transition just isn't about green jobs. It's about getting back what we had culturally. Jackson is 80 to 85 percent black. The vast majority of the capital in Jackson, Mississippi, is still owned by a small number of white landlords and their families who've been basically in place and running a joint since around the 18th century. About 50 percent of the community is unemployed and like permanently unemployed. And we're at a stage in the development of capitalism now where it's actually producing fewer and fewer jobs. Most people re already survive through basic aspects of either the underground economy or some variant of a solidarity economy. One of my friends and comrades is now the mayor of the city. Our political mission is to take over the state, not just to take over the, the city. Mississippi is the most unhealthy state in the United States. So we want to improve that. Now, how do you improve that? Creating more jobs is not necessarily the answer. We don't want to add to more pollution, so we switched our thing to where we're job creators to we're quality of life enablers, which is a different framework that we're struggling to try to develop and put together. When I want to shut down the Bakken in North Dakota, it doesn't mean I want to take people's jobs. I don't want to take my family's jobs away. I want them to have alternative solutions. So we're working on things like hemp farms. We're working on things like small-scale wind and solar. We build the solar panels. We build the wind turbines. Not some company where you see these giant things being shipped because transportation then becomes a problem. Right now, because Jackson has been divested from and deindustrialized, the land in our community is fairly cheap. But one of the main things that we've been doing is trying to gain as much access to the land in the community as possible. Most of it we purchase, not all of it. We want to decommodify it and make it a communal property. That is one way to get out of the, the settler-colonial dynamic and try not to repeat it. It's not, the, it's not going to break that system, but it's a practice heading in that direction. So that's number one. Uh, and that also has an aspect of trying to stop gentrification and displacement in our community, which is a critical thing. Number two is building as carbon neutral and waste neutral cooperative enterprises and related systems as we can. And the third component is what we call just transition policy. We exist in a state dominated by some of the most reactionary political forces in the country. So when we talk about climate change, and climate solutions, they come with, okay, we're going to block you from doing that. We'll ban it. So we're really concentrating on changing the regulations within the municipality. Because that is something they can't change through the legislative act. But ultimately, we're going to have to legislate this. So that fight is going to have to be waged, both on the municipality, but also within the state. We know the situation is really, really dire. All of the science is pointing to that, and not just the science, the impacts that are being faced already by people on the ground everywhere in the world. No continent has been spared, but of course the poorest and the most vulnerable people are going to be the ones that face the brunt of it and that will be the most unprepared to deal with it. You just can't describe it what's actually happening. Something that you have to see for yourself. People having to leave homes or find new ways to grow their food or having to worry about the rising waters or, or the warming waters even and fish leaving and it's just a whole need to change the lifestyle to adapt and some people even having to leave home. So for us there's no choice but to stand up and say something. In Puerto Rico we just had a whole bunch of hurricanes, two of them category five huge hurricanes going through in no small measure due to climate-induced changes in temperature in the Caribbean Sea. Water was gone, most of the agriculture was gone. We still have 
most of the island without power. We have very limited communications. People are starving. People are cold. Our government decided to hoard food, hoard gasoline, take in all the money and the funding that was coming in. Nothing was reaching us. And when Cuba decided that they wanted to send a work brigade to help us with electricity, the US prohibited them from coming over. Just transition that just recovered. It's about building upon what survives in our kind of weather and in our new changing weather that we're facing now. It's being free to plant in our own land, because the land is not ours, the entire archipelago belongs to the US. It's also being able to plant what we know we can plant and we should plant, not what Monsanto tells us to plant. To support each other, collectivizing the recovery. Houston recently got flooded with Hurricane Harvey. There's a lot of people that are being displaced. People that are in wheelchairs, the elderly, that were in nursing homes and hospitals. They're being moved outside of the city of Houston. And once that happens, a lot of them actually don't never come back. A lot of immigrants, or even those that don't know how to speak English but are here legally, are being denied public assistance for rebuilding their homes and doing whatever it takes. On the east side of town, where we have all the refineries, while we were not flooded with water, we were flooded with toxic chemicals that were being released by the industries because they told them, shut down and release everything you have so that mm -hmm. the plants won't blow up, right? There is a pattern of where the industry builds a polluting industry, and those facilities that nobody wants in their backyard tend to be built in communities of color. In the Philippines, which is at the forefront of the climate change, having been battered by a number of huge and very destructive typhoons, now we're facing uh, the threat of authoritarianism with about 14,000 deaths, since Duterte came to power, and now he's threatening to declare martial law anytime soon. Despite all this, the campaign to push back on coal is still going on. In 2012, we were confronting 10 new coal plants. But now, it's 59 coal plants. And that's just half of what the Indonesians are fighting against, and one third of what the Vietnamese are fighting against. We've actually already lost uh, Holi, one of the leaders, that has been opposing uh, a coal uh, port and uh, a coal plant. She was one of the first who was extrajudicially killed when the Duterte administration came into power. We managed to actually derail around seven big coal plants quite recently through legal means combined with mobilization on the ground. For the first time, coal is no longer cheap, around 3 pesos and 66 cents per kilowatt hour, and the latest bid of a solar company is 2 pesos and 99 cents. And if these coal contracts will be approved, for the next 20 years, we will be locked in to a costlier energy, a dirty energy, and a deadly energy. It's now a national debate. And in response, some of the senators and even the Department of Finance came up with a proposal to tax coal. This is a dying industry. In China alone, from 2016 to 2017, one million workers lost their job. In the mining sector only, the workers' movement needs to be proactive and think about this before government discusses it and would be detrimental to them. We're in the same boat, and this boat is sinking, whether you're from the Philippines or the Rhine.
Chile began in New York City five years ago. We felt that the energy trends and the emissions trends are so horrific that we need to assert confidently and with utmost determination the need for public ownership and democratic control over energy systems. Since then, we've actually built up a strong US presence, particularly with the unions that oppose the Keystone Pipeline. We're about 60 unions now from 21 countries. The green growth model of mobilized private investment in the green economy, of talking about the great profit-making opportunities of green transition, this is not working. It's not producing the transition that we need. For us in Friends of the Earth, ownership of energy is absolutely fundamental. It's about who owns the energy system, who owns the means of energy production, and who controls it. And I'd urge you, when you talk about ownership, not just to think about municipalization or state ownership, although that's really important, but also to think about cooperatives and community ownership. I don't say one over the other, but they need to go together, and there are excellent ways that they can go together. The Labour Party, in its election manifesto, had for the first time began to develop a truly radical uh, energy programme, and one which met the public mood. You know, the, the idea of pub bringing our energy system back into public ownership is supported by up to 80% of people. A really historic motion was passed unanimously by the trade union movement to um, support and, and lobby for the public ownership and democratic control of the energy system. It also had things in there around industrial strategy and just transition, around divestment of fossil fuels from pension funds. But as we all know, as good as any motion is, um, it needs implementing and it's how we now take it forward. In Australia, we're seeing the breaking down um, of the privatisation dogma uh, in uh, the energy sector. That's mainly as a result of increased prices to the point where energy prices are the number one political issue. So there's a mood for change. The Conservative government uh, in Australia is now using uh, that mood as a reason to say we need to in intervene in the energy market by building new coal-fired power stations. Bill Shorten is the Labor leader and uh, he came out and made some statements about saying that there needed to be an honest conversation about the role of privatisation in the energy sector. And this is a really, really significant step for uh, the, the national leader of the opposition, the, the alternate PM, who's 10 points ahead in the polls. Post offices are often the largest retail presences in countries and probably very much suited to the Canadian reality. If you have an electric vehicle, um, you cannot drive across the country. You cannot charge because there's such a low population density. Nobody is ever going to put out a charging station in the private sector. So we think that's a great argument for public services and the value of universal public services. The government of Quebec uh, built its uh, energy and climate change um, politics around carbon uh, trade, around eco-fiscality, all financial kind of ways. And they had this brilliant idea to develop uh, recently fossil fuels and shell gas to finance transition. 700 of the, the richest people on the planet, that wealth could actually be used to power all of Africa, mm -hmm. all of Latin America, and most of Asia with 100% renewable energy by 2030. <laughs> y los trabajadores. Se realiza a partir de diferentes perspectivas, con diferentes estrategias, eh, intentando ampli ampliar lo más posible nuestra actuación ¿no? y la resistencia. And this pit closed back in the 60s. It was then taken over by the oil and gas industry. When I started here, it was uh, jackets, top size for uh, it was oil fields, but they went into the renewables now. It's kind of the same work, you know. We're actually building the things that go into the, go into the seabed, and then the turbine sits on top of it. It's quite a crucial component to the renewable sector. Currently, we're doing a job for seabed heavy lifting. By far, reckon that we rode a few million pounds from them for work that we've already completed and apparently refusing to pay it.
So we're now in a position where there's no more money coming in. The guys are actually working at the moment without any wages. We're coming into work, we're working as normal. We believe that they're trying to shut it down so they can maybe come in here themselves and use this yard to their own benefit with obviously the resources that are already in it. They've got a history of going in, making a company go bust and then taking over that company themselves for their own benefits. We're just kind of stopping anything going in or out this yard just to keep this yard open for us until we find a solution. Either somebody comes in here and puts some funds up for us. With Scotland being one of the top countries for renewables, I think they should be looking into try and keep this open because there's work coming out for renewables. I think they should be trying to get work to come into this yard. This is your sort of last major employer was going to be in Fife. 1,400 is the effect on just for Bifab alone, over 2,000 in the supply chain. They've got apprentices in here just now who could come out as good training because they're getting trained with the boys that serve their time in here. All these um, highly trained tradesmen have been at this for years. They're going, all this experience is all going to be lost. If you had not taken the stand that you have, if you had not occupied those yards, I promise you your yards were closed on Monday. You're an absolute inspiration to, to the Scottish trade union movement and I hope the people of Scotland are proud of you. <laughs> Workers fighting back opens a window of opportunity to talk about a different kind of society. The problem at the moment is it doesn't look like there's any kind of plan. You know, OK, the Scottish Government bans fracking. What does it mean? They hand over to Ineos the right to bring in uh, shale oil and, and everything from all over the world. When 100,000 jobs disappear in the North Sea, what is the plan? What's the plan for the other fields that have not been developed? We want all fuels that are damaging the planet kept in the ground. But on a short-term basis, we could build up funds that's necessary to build that future. The Scottish Government has recently had a big consultation over future energy policy and we got together a group of people to put in a submission to that, looking after the jobs of people who are currently employed in defence and construction and the oil industry and so on, making the best use of their skills, not putting them on the scrap people. We face a continuing economic crisis of which probably the most important result is mass unemployment in many, many parts of the world. We have to have another way of providing energy for the world. All of those ways of providing energy for the world take much more jobs, much more work than burning coal. Climate jobs only means jobs that make a real contribution to reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Globally, we think about 120 million jobs. Trident is the most extreme example. We're now talking about an expenditure of the Trident replacement program of around 250 billion pounds. The number of jobs that are directly employed around Trident and the west of Scotland is a few hundred. If you take all of the kind of knock-on jobs, maybe you're up to about 20,000. It's equivalent of 100,000 extra nurses over the period of the next 20 years or so. Many of the people who work at Faslane and Coolport have the kinds of skills which are actually relatively easily transferred into renewable energy. The very early developments around uh, wave and tidal were developed actually here in Edinburgh by a guy called Stephen Salter back in the 70s. He estimates that the channel that runs around the north of Scotland is the potential to generate more electric power than is required for the whole of Europe. When you look at the kind of money that's been invested in wave and tidal power, typically 5 million, 10 million, you start thinking about 250 billion and what would become possible and what that would then mean in terms of jobs. The Scottish Government is going to introduce um, a new company, Scottish Energy Company, to try and um, reduce fuel poverty. These are positive things, but if they're not taken on the scale necessary, they will be only sticking plasters on a broken leg. Outside the central belt, between 60 and 70 percent of over 60 year olds live in houses which they can't afford to heat in the winter. We know how to insulate houses, we know how to build houses which are energy efficient. If we had a program of mass insulation, we would create a very large number of jobs and we would make a huge difference to a lot of people's lives. Many of us who have been campaigning over the environment, trying to tie it to workers' demands, we're beginning to see the possibilities of the reality from the paper to the street, to the factory, to the demands for the rank and file. 
to have a different kind of world and a different kind of future, which guarantees them terms and conditions, but also guarantees them a better world. This land is your land, this land is my land.